going to start with a poem called Three Actions, which is three poems in one. And um, uh, do we know the story of Actaeon yet? The sort of the origin of the hunter becomes the hunted. He's a, a Greek myth. We're okay. The poems kind of explain a little bit. I won't say too much, but um, he has a rough time of it, to say the least. Three Actaeons. One. Some names are words for grief, graceless words for failure. Actaeon was a crowd, a lonely man, and in the end, nothing awaiting his descent into simple witlessness, cold beside a river of fire, who, the story goes, either wandered into a grove sacred to Artemis and saw her bathing naked, or boasted he was the greater hunter. And so, enduring the deep wrath of God, thinking no way out of this, about to surrender, it came to him that like any hound or creature in this world, he too had yearned and hunted. Later on in the underworld, he would wonder about Symmetry, his cousin, unborn heirs to the throne of Cadmus, and whether or not he'd been forgiven. A crowd, a lonely man, nothing, awaiting his descent into witlessness, and so cold near Phlegethon, boundless river of fire. Some men have grief in place of dreams. How cold and sad an end those men will come to. White caps over the blue, no linden trees or red acorns under which to find shade and not one god to pray for mercy to. It goes down from there, I'm afraid. Poor hapless Actaeon. <laughs> Two, Cy Twombly's Death of Actaeon, 1962-63. Now the dogs are loud and black. Now it should be blood and skin is yellowing as a fire fighting to ignite everywhere yellows at its edges. There is no wind in the trees, no wild heavens, no movement but on the earth. We find ourselves at the end of a story, past the stumbling into sin, beyond the transgression, or whatever it is sets a goddess off. Artemis, dressed in dignity and sanity, is gone, left before the finale. Yes, here it comes. The forest full of black dogs, loud but not barking, an Acteon, their teeth in his seams, head held high, belling out their names. Well, she knew how it would end. Three, from the Austrian German of Ralph Schrott. Yesterday at noon, thin cypress shadows raking the sun over the hills, you ascended the stairs of the house, passing me with fewer than no words, and in the way your hair moved, I noticed, sensed, that something was different. There was only one look, I expected nothing, and followed you. Your sandals, your sandals in the hallway, where you slipped out of your dress, carefree, your leather purse on the tile. I didn't bend myself down to it, but instead pushed the door to the shower open slowly. You sang out in a shrill falsetto, and I stared at you, how you over my back, small hands, over blushing breasts, then knew you'd been with another man, that you stood more naked than I or the world would ever find you, your hair dripping water onto your clavicles and wrapping itself around you like a net. Speak. Say what you have to say. That I, while hunting for the same, had surprised you and cut out my tongue. Your fingers flicked water at me hard, like rain in the face, and I sank into my heels. Truth, a broken mirror. Shame, an invisible wound. Hounds panting in the grass below clawed at each other. They're barking such that it fed itself into the heat. A little more lighthearted, this is uh, called How I Became One of My Poems. And it's the story of how I became one of my poems. It's for all the novelists in the room. I apologize in advance for that. This is the story of who woke one morning in her bedroom to the sound of dogs barking and realized that her body was the same shape as Ubu's in Max Ernst's portrait, wrote the young novelist, who had decided she wanted to write something clever. Her previous attempt, which was a story itself in first person, starring a young woman who fell in love with a man who resembled Ubu in Max Ernst's portrait himself, had led her nowhere, and a decision was made after two weeks of starts and misstarts to abandon the premise and begin anew. The first clue to being clever, she decided, was to make everything resonate. She would begin, for instance, with that first sentence. Did Ubu have a dog? 
She didn't know. She had never read the play and only knew the painting by Max Ernst from a catalog she had seen in a bookstore near her house. The color plate was cold and dark, but she knew she herself would be very entertained by a lover who spun like a top, and so the decision to write the story. How did one realize upon waking up that one's body had become a spinning top? She thought to herself, sitting over the keyboard. Perhaps the realization was one that a young woman must come to over the course of the story, she concluded, and so rewrote the first sentence, leaving out the dogs as well. This is the story of who woke one morning. She stopped. What was the initial impetus for including dogs, she wondered. Although at night she had often heard dogs barking, it was rare that one woke her, and so where had the idea come from that barking dogs might wake her character? She froze and stared out the window. Her apartment had a view from over the city facing south towards the water, but with the haze of the day she couldn't see very far out. This is the story of, she wrote. She had still not decided on a name for her character either. In clever books, names always resonate, she thought, but in what way? For instance, she knew from the front of the catalog that Max Ernst had been involved with other painters, many women, but Leonora and Dorothea sounded ridiculous and far too mid-century, and Merritt was just too foreign. If she called her character Carrie Tanning, Carrie for Leonora Carrington, and Tanning from Dorothea, but Tanning sounded too upper-class New York, American to her, like a store where one bought chandeliers, Tanning's on Fifth, and then backed with Carrie, which was too southwestern Ontario in its way, to her, or maybe even rang with the Stephen Kingish tone. This is the story of, she wrote, Maybe the beginning was too clever, she thought. Who starts stories with this is the story of and thinks adults will read it? But she had not read enough Doris Lessing to be able to answer that question. <laughs> a lover who spins like a top. How would she love him? Her hands fell away from the keyboard to her sides. The horizon was not getting clearer through her window. She stood up from her chair and pushed it in until it clacked against her desk. She began to turn herself slowly so as not to get too dizzy too quickly, her bare feet on the polished wood floor. This is the story of the novelist, she wrote, she thought, who spun herself into the floor like a screw. She had never heard of Kafka's the, th the top. Her stomach turned over once and she stopped, facing the wall, her head a little sore from the low pressure system moving into the city. Soon it was going to rain. Here, it is necessary for me to write this. Soon it was going to rain. And then she had too many clothes on. Necessary because it was going to rain, it did rain. She had too many clothes on. But in the space it takes to write this, how many proper stories could have been finished? Stories which could have been testimony, yes, or commentary, maybe. But it wasn't ever going to rain, you know. The phone might ring and stop her train of thought, but it wouldn't be for her. And so on that day, rain never came. She stood there, naked in the sunlight which shone through her window filling a space in which my intentions were beginning to spin. In the third part, I think, of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, um, Eliot, as Tiresias, bumps into a Smyrna's, Smyrna's merchant, a guy called uh, Mr. Evianides, um, or Mr. Eugenides, if you're North American, I guess. And um, this poem is about a sort of meeting I had with Mr. Eugenides, Mr. Evianides, where he gets to talk back about his uh, he seems to make a pass at Eliot in the poem. I'm not quite certain what happens, or Eliot Theresius. And I don't quite know why Eliot Theresius is so uncomfortable with that, being that Theresius is both man and woman. What's the problem, really? Here's Mr. Eugenides gets his words back in. Mr. Eugenides, Mr. Evianides, the Smyrna merchant. One. Once, when I asked him to lunch, reported Mr. Evianides, he cracked up, unshaven with a pocket full of currants, his thin-nostrilled Tyrrhenian nose twitching. For all his charms and faults, fair grooming, this was years ago. We could have a good time. He knocked his salad fork to the floor, gathered it with grit and hair into his sticky fingers. Friends? No, and yes. He was someone who could be asked too much of. He put the fork into his satchel, the brown one, always by his side, in which he also kept notebook and pens. He was avoiding the maitre d', the waiters, had ordered only appetizers and a cup of tea. Back then, there wasn't as much of civilization. He preferred it. He kicked the table leg, but then changed his mind. 
I'm only saying a wet stone drying in the sun, here and gone. Two. Looking to the seawall, I caught sight of a horse, the story continued, from memory, from sharpness of pain. It was on fire, was chasing wildly across the quayside, trampling children, its hindquarters engulfed in flames. Our second meeting, in khaki chinos and a striped Oxford, he, in showing trust, shaved, washed, let me buy him lunch. Here was the horse, determined. He dropped his drinking glass and covered the table with cola. Going up to heaven, pulling its chariot of fire. Our waiter delivered cloth napkins, fumbled a half smile and slipped away. This was 14 September, 1922. A month later, I was back in London, rid of friends and any relations. Yes, his poem was in the Criterion. We never spoke after that. <laughs>